Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together in fellowship and in trueness of your word. We thank you for our safe travels, uh, your provision of physical well-being, but also your provision for uh, spiritual well-being. May we feast on your word this morning. Um, may we uh, grow in grace, grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus through it. Uh, touch our hearts, because as the song said, today might be the day, Lord, uh, I don't know all the hearts in this room, but you do. And uh, we ask that you would touch people by your word, move them by conviction, and that we may know that there is life everlasting with you. And uh, that's what we're looking forward to. And, uh, just praise your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, Psalm 139, I have labeled as all. Now, put your fingers stretched out because. I'm referred to as Mr. Colin and with the kids. I apologize to our videographer because I might move around with it, so I'm going to try to stay with it here. I'm a little excited. Um, it's broken up, Psalm 139 is broken up into four parts. Uh, the first six verses, the Psalm of David, he's given this psalm to his physicians uh, to write a beautiful song to it. And as we read it, if you read it in its entirety, you see it's somewhat rhythmic. First six verses are exemplifying God's omniscience. Omni meaning all. He's all encompassing. Um, second verses from verses uh, six through twelve or seven through twelve are all about his omnipresence. And then we're going to go on to his omnipotence, his all powerful. And then there's a conclusion. The last six verses in the psalm. Kind of takes a shift as you're reading it. It's like, well, how was that put in there? The context of all the first 18 verses coincide with that, right? That's how that works. So he's going to be speaking to each one of our hearts, and uh, there's conviction there at the end. Um, there's a fine line. If we get to the the end of the the psalm today, you'll notice that there's a decision that has to be made. So we're going to give God all the glory, and He requires it. And we're going to find that out in this, in this psalm today. So, let's start out right away. Omniscience. Pause in Greek. Omni actually comes from the Latin language. Omniscience, he's all knowing. And I would like to have a little bit of everybody to join that. I'm going to label this first six verses God knows all about you. But I would also like to hear it from you. God, let's make it all personal. God knows all about me. All right, everybody. God, God knows, knows all God about God. me. And that's it, right? We can end the study right there. But we're going to delve into the knowledge of our Lord more. Man has a tendency to want to study more about self than our Creator and God. There's a lot of programs out there, psychology, psychiatry, you name it. People are searching. People are lost. Uh, we all know people within our families, in our realms, and our friends. We need the Lord Jesus. And um, all these studies, all these Bible studies that we do here, it's been a blessing for God. Obviously, uh, we have a lot of love within the room here, fellowship. Uh, we need to carry that outside these doors. That's why we're learning to exhort, edify the brethren, but also be equipped. We need apologetics. Um, as we grow in the faith, as we prayed earlier about the grace and knowledge of our Jesus Christ, we grow every day in that. I'm actually going to go another step further about as we get into the studies here, um, there's questions, and I'm all about questions, asking the right questions, because we can ask a lot of questions that really don't pertain to anything. The question is, if God knows all things, is there anything that he doesn't know? Oh, that's kind of simple, right? Another question I would like you to pose to yourself, is God surprised by circumstance? Fourth, or third, uh, God knows my thoughts before I do? And fourth, can we hide our thoughts and intent from Him? Uh, we can say yes and no to a lot of those questions, and uh, I pray that as we study this text, would enlighten us a little bit. 
You might even come out of this thinking that, Lord, you know what? I don't believe in you wholeheartedly. And in that, and all that Jesus had done for me at the cross, I am justified. I am sanctified. I go as far as saying I am glorified. <laughs> so, those are hard words to hear. Because we're not always taught that. Now, the omniscience of God, either he's all-knowing or he's not. All right, let's start in the text. A little precursor to that. First six verses of Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting, my uprising. Thou understands my thoughts afar off. Thou compass my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast to set me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain unto it. So if you notice in verse 1, the word hast has been presented there. The word searched, known. They sound like they're already past tense in a person's life, right? God has already been acquainted with each one of you. And as we continue in our text, we're going to find out he knew that. He formed you in the womb. Those who are familiar with Psalm 139, we're going to be covered. He knit you together perfectly as a body. But he formed you. He knew you as a soul. He gave you a spirit before he gave you a body. This is before the foundation of the world. And we know that all are not saved. We know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to flee. We struggle with that, right? God knows all things from beginning to end. We do not. He requires of us, as believers, true worship and to glorify Him in all we do. That's why He designed us, you know. We give Him glory. Let's turn to Hebrews 4, verse 12, right away. Something about the Word of God that touches lives. Touched all of our lives, one way or another, I pray. Mine, I'm going to speak for myself specifically, obviously, you get saved through the Word of God. You can read a lot of self-help books. It's empty, because you're looking at self. You look in the mirror, you're looking at self. It might be great for a day or two or a week. You fall off, and it's like, boy, I fell there. Now, who's sustaining a believer? Is the omniscient, the all-created God, sovereign God. Hebrews 4, we've gone through this many times here already. Verse 12. For the word of God is quick, it's alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrows, is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We don't even know our own motives. God does. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things, all things, are naked and open unto his eyes of whom we have to deal. That word open, as I was studying through this, I didn't realize this, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, the word open in Greek, trekaletzo, is actually to the point where they would take an animal as sacrifice, they would lay it out before the priest, and they would expose the neck because they're going to take that knife and kill that animal. That's exposure. Open and naked to our Lord. There's nothing hidden from Him. That's a hard thought. You're thinking that all things are exposed to our Lord and God. Right? First Thessalonians. If you could turn there, please. Chapter 5. I'm going to have you go through these. So bear with me. First Thessalonians. Chapter 5, verse 23. I was talking earlier about how the Word of God divides the soul and spirit. Now it's really hard. As you study that, it's hard to differentiate the two. And this study helped me understand the soul, the spirit, and there is body. And we're going to find that out right here. Paul's writing to the Thessalonican church. Uh, 
uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23 to 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Hmm. God does the sanctifying. And I pray, God, your God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. Blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he, a man, that calls you to do also, uh, calls you, who also will do it. You're set apart, you're sealed. He's called. God does it. He searched you out. If you're a believer today, he searched you out. He convicted your spirit. Your soul lives forever. Your spirit is either dead or it is alive. You know, we've heard the term born again, right? When you're born again, God's spirit enters into your spirit, makes you alive. We're all dead to sin. We're born sinners. We can't save ourselves. Jesus came to this earth as a perfect man. God had, like figure, gave his blood for us. We fall short of the glory of God, right? He did that. So the soul and spirit are divided. The word of God divides that. He's testing you in your spirit daily. He wants your soul to worship him. He wants your soul. He's developed, he's formed it, he created it to worship him. The spirit is wavering. Man's spirit, God always said, I will not always strive with that spirit. Right? Wavering. It's dead to him until you're born again. The faith of Abraham. That's how we have fellowship with God. Obviously, the body we know, if we can look in the mirror, and we are decaying daily. <laughs> this is a cursed world, cursed earth. Uh, we pray for illnesses. Obviously, this is a fallen world. The body we have, this tabernacle, Paul writes, is diminishing daily until the coming of our Lord Jesus, right? Then we'll have those new bodies. Dead and right. Uh, Christ will rise again. Those new bodies in heaven. And then we can worship Him in truth and in spirit. Spirit uses His word to convict your soul, making that choice. Your inward man, aligned with the sovereignty in His precepts, His laws. And like I said, John 4, 23, 24. I'm going to turn here quick. Let's close this up. Is that page wrestling? Verse 23, John 4. But the hour cometh now, yes, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that in lies. That communion he wants, that fellowship he wants, your spirit has to be aligned with it. He's already made your soul. It's either going to be everlasting hell or in heaven. Today might be the day you make that decision. Today, hour is today. If the Holy Spirit is working on your heart, today is the day. You can have everlasting life. Sounds really easy. But it gets hard after that. You make that commitment, then it gets hard. <laughs> He's going to test you. He's going to make trials in your life. And that's the refiner's fire that we say. We need that. Otherwise, we think we can back up and it's like, oh, I did that on my own. Or I'm doing this on my own. No, there you are not. It is all about God, and He's the one that does the work. Right? So, the body's a vessel, a tabernacle, He came. Revelation 4 states that He's formed all things, and He created all things for His pleasure. That's it. With that, we can walk out of here to it. Everything he's created is for his pleasure. Now, there's things that are created unto honor, and there's things that are created under, unto dishonor. God already knows that, right? We've struggled in past studies. All of us have. Did God really harden Pharaoh's heart? The text says he did. Did God really know Pharaoh's soul from beginning to end? Was there anything in the middle of the circumstances that he decided, you know what? I don't know. I'm going to change my mind. God says he changes not. He knows all of our souls from beginning to end. 
We read through all the prophecies of this book. We read through John going to the heavenly realms during the tribulation period. There's souls there he's talking with. That has yet become. Our God is not constrained by time. Our God is not constrained by circumstances. He's using the wrath of man in a lot of instances to fulfill his word. That's the God we have to worship and praise. Now, we don't know who that is. We don't know the knowledge of God. He wants us to understand him better, grow in the grace and knowledge of him. But we, we can't dictate what God decides to do. He's telling us briefly how he's done it, what he's expecting those who, who love him. So, verse 24 back in Thessalonians 5 is, The person, the work of Christ, he will accomplish all things. It's accordance to his own will on ours. All right, we're still going to be turning here, gang. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, please. Get the dust off the Bible. Say, I'm sorry, I should just... Anybody need a Bible? We have them at the door. We have an usher that can hand them out if you need the Word of God in your hand. we got to get our fingers used to do... Remember that old commercial? Fingers do the walking so we can do the talk in the yellow pages? I tell the kids that. You can't do anything like this with apologetics unless we're doing this. You gotta understand where we're gonna find these things, and it's a blessing as you as you study God's word, He's gonna open up things that is like, well, I've never seen that before. And you have to use that because He's telling you for a reason. Yeah, your growth is important, but He's telling you, you know what? There's people out there, there's people who are probably in this room that need to know Jesus personally. You're brought here, you're drawn here for some reason today. And that's that spirit, the conviction of the spirit. It could take years. It took almost 40 years for me to listen. I did all the right rules, the Old Testament here. Said all the right words, churchianity, religiosity, all that, the right rules at the right time. Oh, I shine. I fell. And when I fell, before I got up, I went to my knees. Excuse me. <coughs> Praise the Lord. <coughs> ah, all right, back to the text. <clears throat> when I got to my knees, I begged his forgiveness. My spirit was in line with his. Born again. Not by baptismal waters. Not by liturgy. A relationship. All right. Everybody there? Ephesians 1, please. We're going to start at verse 10. <clears throat> that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, you might gather together in one all things in Christ, Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. He does the working after the counsel of his own will, his will. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, the Son, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the two-edged sword, the good news, the gospel of your salvation, the good news, that sword penetrated you listen. Jesus often said, He that hath an ear, let him hear. Two edged sword sticking in between soul and spirit, dividing. And also, you believed you were sealed. Hmm. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or the guarantee of our, he's talking about believers, inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possessions unto the praise of his glory, not ours. Purchased possession. Verse 10, dispensation. Actually, just God's plan. Timing already mapped out, predestined. That's what predestined means. It's mapped out, the horizon's mapped out already. According to his will. Now, like I said earlier, some will tend to jump to labeling people in camps that they see as 
not accepting according to God's volitional choice. He gives us volitional choice, I'm not denying that. We all have volitional choice. We don't even know our own choices yet in our life. We don't know the person next to us, their choices, God does. He's been there, he's done that. He's lived everything, beginning to end. We don't know. So once you become a believer, you just want to praise him. And through that, he uses it. He already knows the last person who's going to be saved. He knows the name. He knows the hour, place. He knows it already. We have to be going about doing his will. Because we worship him. We want to glorify him. That's the spirit within us. He's using it daily. That doesn't mean we sit back in our haunches like somebody's driving down the highway and say, oh, God knows everything. I'm just going to take my hands off the wheel and let my car go where I want to go. But he's going to say, dummy, I'm going to have you crash. Keep your hands on the wheel. You can use that. Things are in God's hands and in control. He already knows what you're going to do. He knows what you have for breakfast, what you have for supper, all that stuff. Even the small things of life, he understands, he knows. He's been there, he's seen it. We're going to get into that text a little bit. So there's volitional choice. God already knows who are his. Time and circumstance does not restrain our Lord. We do not know. We are called to worship and praise him as believers for our inheritance. A little bit more on that. Let's go to Jeremiah, the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm trying to rush through this a little bit. I think I've only got an hour left. <laughs> Alright, some people listen. Alright. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. You've heard this before, right? Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I set thee apart. I ordained, anointed thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Hmm. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go through all that I send, shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I that put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. God's doing the work through Jeremiah. You already have that plan done. Yes, we look at our Lord and Savior. You already have that planned out before he created the world. This is a God we worship. Sometimes I think, a lot of times, we read through our Bibles kind of quickly. I do it. And all these little, no, I shouldn't say little, all these words that pertain to original text, as close as you can get, are very, very important. Right? God's very precise on his deliverance of his word. A lot of times you'll hear that the um, writers of the book were inspired. I would like to look at it better as the word was inspired, the writers were controlled. Uh, if you go to Acts 27, it's the same verse as the rudder was being controlled by Paul's ship. As if you go into Hebrews chapter 1, it states that the prophets and the scribes were controlled by the Holy Spirit to write what he wanted. Hmm. Again, God's omniscience. We're still in his omniscience yet. God has a sovereign plan. You know, verses 8 and 9. And Jeremiah, go with Psalm 139, verse 5. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. All right, that's speaking about David in that psalm, but also of Jeremiah and each one of us. He's wonderful, he's intimate, and he's involved with our care every day. Verses 8 and 9 in uh, Jeremiah 1. He speaks about, do not be afraid of their faces, for I, Lord God Almighty, is with thee. Deliver thee, saith the Lord, Yahweh. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Moses 
remember the story where uh, people, I think, sometimes maybe misunderstand the text where he stuttered. If you go on to Acts 7, there is a great commentary that Stephen gives about Moses. He was raised up in the Egyptian way of thought, and he was mighty in words and speech. This is what Stephen speaks about Moses. Moses had a second thought, right? And we do too. He's like, Lord, you don't want to use me. I, 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 I really can't speak. He's already been trained up in Egypt. Lord, use him that way. He put him there, right? Pharaoh's daughter found him <laughs> in the water in the Nile River. God has a plan for each one of us. Psalm 139, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain unto it. Hebrew word for wonderful, it's incomprehensible. Pile, Pile. It also describes the name of the angel of the Lord, which is another whole study. In Judges 13, 13 through 18, take a look. Pilea, does he call him? I can't tell you my name because it's too incomprehensible. The angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, the anointed one, is the Messiah himself. Amen. He walked this earth before Jesus was born as a baby. The Messiah has been here. The angel of the Lord, he can tell you exactly what he's doing and what he's not. He's the only one that can command those things that happen. Pilea, too wonderful to even comprehend his name. Romans 11, please. Verse 33. We're going around here. I think this is a great study. It took me only a month and a half to put this together, so if you guys get this in an hour, oh, it's a beautiful thing. Romans 11, verse 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God's wisdom, God's knowledge. How unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him, and all things to whom glory forever. Amen. Past finding out. Romans 11 is a great read on its own. It's describing the relationship of Jew and Gentile, his mercies to both. How both should respond. I would, I would suggest you read it on your own. There's questions asked of man in Job. If people are familiar with Job, like starting in verse 38 through 41. Job had a rough time, right? His friends aren't helping matters at all. They are bad counselors. Because of sin, 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 it's increased. That's why God's doing, 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 doing. God steps back. He gets him both through all of that. He's lost a lot. He starts doing a rebuttal in chapter 38, all the way through 41. Let's go to Job 41, verse 11. If you want, quick, I'm going to turn there. Just before Psalms. Job 41, 11. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? This is the Lord speaking to Job. Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Everything is the Lord's. God's rebuke, he claims, he asks, who's given to me? What should I repay or owe? God is sovereign. He doesn't owe anybody anything. He makes the rules. We have to trust in him, in his plan. And he's gracious enough to give us his word to at least understand what his plan is. The plan of salvation. It's all about Jesus. All 66 books in this wonderful book he's given us are about Jesus, the Messiah, redemption, salvation, sacrifice. Back to 139. Verses 7 through 12. I'm moving on here. All present. He's everywhere. 
And once, always. We can say this again. I've been pretty quiet all amongst you guys. God will never leave me. Let's hear it. God will never leave me. Let's read the text. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? This is Psalm 139, verse 7. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art with, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the outermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light upon me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. <laughs> God will never leave you. God's nearness in verses 7 through 10, his location is everywhere. God is in control of Sheol, Hell, Hades, whatever you call it. Satan is in control of it. He's the chief prisoner someday. God designed hell, not for his believers, but rebellious, the wicked ones, for the fallen angels, for fallen men. Today might be the day. You can make a decision today. I want to escape hell. How do I do that? It's real simple. We can pray on it. Just ask Jesus, Lord Jesus, can you just convict my soul? No, I can't do it now. I cannot do anything to gain my own salvation. It's all through our Lord Jesus. Jeremiah 23, 22. I'm going to turn real quick. You can follow along. That's great. I think it was important to conclude all these texts. I could wrote them all. I just want you to understand the frame of thought that I put together with God's Word here. And then you can take it home to study with you as well. Jeremiah 23, verse 22. We're going to read through 24. But if they that stood at my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I am a God at hand. He is there. Say the Lord God, and he's not a God afar off. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Say the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. Cut and dry, black and white, right there. He's not affected by circumstance. He's not hemmed in by time again. He's everywhere at once. He sees all things. There's nothing hidden from him. And you think that evil might be overcoming in this area, and evil might be overcoming the world. God's alone yeah. He's refining people. He's refiner's fire. We already know as prophet, prophecy boss, eschatology, the end times. We already know that. He's given that to us. We understand he's got a plan. Nothing's going to change that plan. He does not lie. He's given it to us. And that is so personal for every soul in here. He's got a plan. He's willing for you, and waiting in some cases, to use it for his glory. John 8, 56. This one I would like you to turn to. John 8, 56, please. All right, so Jesus is in front of the Sanhedrin, Pharisees and Sadducees. And I've been asking him a lot of questions throughout this chapter, right? And Jesus is getting down the right uh, poignant with these gentlemen. Verse 56. Jesus is rebuking them. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, This is very powerful, Truly, truly, very, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh. What's the next verse say? They pick up stones of stone because he just said that I am. No, they knew exactly what his claim was. People say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, baloney. Amen. Right here. They picked up stones to stone him. I am. He exists in the past. Amen. He exists in the present. He exists in the future. All Amen. at the same time. Amen. Amen. This 
when Abraham rejoiced and he saw, he was glad, I think, I believe, refers to Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It's a story in Genesis 22 about, remember how Abraham took his son Isaac? He was going to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. He was faithful, he was obedient under the Lord's cause, right? God, the angel of the Lord told him God would provide himself a lamb. The angel of the Lord, the Messiah, was there. The angel of the Lord, to tie in with John 5, 58, when Abraham saw and was glad, he knew that the birth offering would come someday. Oh, right. He was willing to put his son, because he knew he'd be alive. He's not the one to be sacrificed. He's not the Messiah. That's why he saw and was glad. Jesus was there, the Messiah. Amen. He's saying that right here to these Pharisees and these Sadducees, and they're blind. We can be blind and walk out here and we hear all this text and all these verses and we're trying to make heads and tails of it, we can still be blind. We've got to pray that the Holy Spirit moves you to understand these things. And once you grasp that, you have an understanding of who the angel of the Lord is, who truly the Messiah is, it changes your life. It really does. Psalm 139, 13-18. Back to the text again. Moving through this now. Bear with me. Omnipotent, right? All powerful. I want to hear this again. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for me, right? Verse 13 through 18. For thou hast possessed my reins, your inner self. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, in thy book all thy members were written, which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with thee. Cover me. I'm going to try to pronounce this. A Hebrew word for cover means a weaver, knit. Sahak. Uh, How's that? Sahak. I created all things. That means to weave, to knit together. Like in Genesis 1.26. Created in our image. Remember that verse from being in Sunday school. Our image. We've, been, we've taken to the text and understand here's the first triunity speaking of God. God's in creation. Sixth day God was created. In our image. Well, who's he speaking about? God the Son. God the Father. God the Father, God the Son. And the Holy Spirit. All three in one. All created. This was interesting. Nashama. Breathe lies in, right? Genesis 2, 7. It's actually lies. A lot of your texts probably say life. It's plural. It's pretty interesting. Genesis 2, 7. Look it up. Nashama breathes lives into the being, right? Job, back to Job 10, 8 through 13, please. A little more rely on this, uh, what Job is asking the Lord, what the Lord is telling him. Job 10, 8 through 13. Thine hands are, have made me, fashion me together round about, that thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee, thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? Hast thou not poured me out as milk, and curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fattened me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. <clears throat> and these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know that this is with thee. So when he breathed lives into the being of man, life is from God alone. All life. Lives. That soul, that spirit that he wants alive with you. Yeah, we have physical being. He's breathed lives into animals. He breathed life into man. He's given man a soul and a spirit. 
to worship him for his glory. Yashar was the word formed, physical man, from the elements and created Bahra. Two different things. He formed man, all the dust and earth, right? We have 17 elements within our body from the earth. This decays. He created man in his image. That means we have a conscience. This is our being. You hear about it in the old King James, the reins. The reins of the heart. Being, the affection, those attributes, emotion, worship. Again, Revelation 4. It's all for his pleasure. And comfort and knowing that God has precious thoughts of you and of me. Verse 16, talking about the books of life which he created are written. Revelation 20, verse 12. To be dead without the Spirit, right? The books were open, and then there's a, a book, singular, of life. That's where the Spirit has taken those who are born alive again in Jesus. The books are written and known as that you are not born again, and they're cast into the fiery hell. Is your name written in the book of life today? Today might be the day. Listen to what the Lord is telling you. No. It's not too late yet. The Spirit will dictate the soul written in the book of life. James 2.26 For as the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That means I have to do something to show forth my faith. You do it gladly. Amen. You do it gladly, and it shows forth that, you know, this is what I believe. Our actions, our words, our thoughts, everything dictate what you believe. Where are your priorities? Right? We have priorities in our life. Right now, our thoughts may not be on the text. I'm going to go long-winded. I know it's hard. There's things in our life that overcome. This building is wonderful. We can join this together. Someday, this is going to be gone. If the Lord does, if he tarries, I've got a feeling that we are going to be separated. We'll, we're going to have to be in caves again, or whatever it takes to me, let's enjoy this time now. He searched. No one, went, no one gets away with anything in verse 19. Right? Psalm 139, 19 to 24. We're going to finish this up. This is all conclusion now after his omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take your name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. Then here is the arrow. Verse 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Now to ask those two questions, or that verse right there is tough truly mean it? He's not going to give you just little portions if you ask for that. Search me, O God, and know my heart. He already knows. Try me. Know my thoughts. Somebody who believes in the trustworthiness of God's word, his faithfulness, true faith is built on the great God. Not what I can do. Not my works. Psalm 5, five states, God hates all workers of iniquity. Do we not grieve within ourselves those who rise up and slander our Lord? God does not love all the same. He gave his son to die for the world because he so loved the world, but he doesn't love all the same. Psalm 5.5 5 states, God hates all workers of iniquity. Psalm 11.5.6, God hateth the soul who loveth violence. Psalm 45.7, God hates wickedness. 1 Samuel 2, 3-10, we're going to show God's judging hand here. Yeah, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2, 3 through 10. We're almost done here. Bear with me, please. I'm going to get this completed. Lord willing. 1 Samuel 2, verses 3 through 10. God's judgment. Talk no more so exceedingly proud that not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Hmm. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. They that were hungry cease. 
so that the barren hath born seven, and she that hath many children is wax feeble. The Lord kills, the Lord makes alive, he bringeth down the grave, he bringeth it up. The Lord maketh poor, he maketh rich, he bringeth low, he lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust, he lifts up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon him. Who? He. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Out of heaven shall the thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king. Who? His king, the Messiah, the exalted horn, the anointed, the Messiah. Amen to that. That's pretty cut and dried right there. God kills, he makes alive. God destroys, he builds. He judges, that's our Lord. We follow his rules, not ours. There's a lot of fanciful teachings out today that say, you know what, is that really what God said? Where have we heard that before? Garden, amen. Adam was disobedient flat out. Eve was dis was uh, deceived. Adam fell right into it. Satan's still out there deceiving many people. We have to go out of this, this room, out of these doors, to exhort, to encourage, and be equipped to help people in time of need. People are hopeless right now. There may be some in here. You have to know the peace of the Lord Jesus. It's easy words to say once you're a believer, but you have to put yourself in a place where you work. To hear that, what does that really mean? There's that conviction, that sword dividing soul and spirit. So, today, ask God to search you, to refine you. Find more of Him, less of self. Submission, obedience are required for giving God glory and honoring Him. All right, with that, we'll end this today. Uh, Thank you for your patience. I'll pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this time that you brought us together. Today is the day of salvation. It might be today for one of us in here today. Ask yourself, am I spiritually dead? Am I spiritually alive? Do I have that stamp, that seal of approval? Am I in the book of life? You want to be assured of that. Because he seals you once you are. You'll falter, but he'll lift you up. The way to honor the Father is to know his Son personally. And by our actions, to show forth our faith and trust in finished and completed work of the Messiah. In his name I pray. Amen. Thank you.